here, I recognize some familiar faces, and unfortunately for those of you that were excited to see Ramita, she is unable to make it. I, did some of you meet her at an open ed conference several years ago uh, up in Logan? Um, so she, she's been along for the hall as we've been collecting this data, and she actually made it to the USA um, trying to come to the conference and is now uh, in the process of having an arranged marriage uh, on the East Coast, and so that's that's trumped this conference. Um, so why um, did I get involved in this study of localization of OER? Um, my background is in literacy, and I was really interested in uh, looking at strategies to help rural people sustain their learning plan after they graduate from literacy courses. So lots of times literacy projects are funded by international donors, and when the donors leave, then the materials are gone, the teachers are gone, and learners are kind of left to their own ends. And you find in these villages there's very few reading materials in the first place. Um, so that's the big question, how do we sustain this? Um, and the big thing that people talk about is a culture of literacy. How do we really... Um, change the mentality so that people are self-learners and they're able to be their own teachers in a sense, or at least engage in the, the strategies for their own families and their homes. Um, increasingly, we have seen that there are these rural community centers in developing countries. Um, I'm guessing that if some of you are in here, you might have a background in this, so uh, we'll have some dialogue later, but I'd love to hear what you've seen. Um, I first got inter in, interested in this in Pakistan, where several people said, hey, we need to create libraries, and we don't have money to buy lots of books, but if you could help us get a couple computers, we could put content on computers. And in Nepal, it's really, really um, rugged terrain, and increasingly they're doing wire wireless mesh networks across the tops of mountains. So we're finding that people are getting connected, they just don't know what's quality content. Um, so there's about 2,000 community centers that we were looking at, and 200 or more of them have access to ICT and occasional internet. It's not always consistent. There's a lot of blackouts, so they call it load shedding in Nepal. So that's an issue, but when they are connected, what content can they get access to? Um, so we've learned that if, if content is digital, that more people can share it. There's not a competitive use. David Wiley's talked about the, the calculator metaphor that, or the single book metaphor that not many people can share at the same time. Whereas a health manual that's digital, everyone can be using at the same time. So the definitions for this study, um, I'll just real quickly talk about localization, OER, which I think most of you know, and then knowledge workers. Um, so localization we define as being tailored to the culture, to the religion, to the place basically to the needs that the locals view as the most important in their area. And that does change. It's not always defined the same place to place. Um, and then OER, in a nutshell, is the ability to reuse, redistribute, revise, or remix the content. Um, this is one example, a pilot that we started working on, Open Content for Development, where we were uh, digitizing and making accessible some literacy materials. Um, basically, they were... PDFs and wikis that people could reorganize, translate, add in their own kinds of pictures and, and make useful to their own needs, for their own needs. And then knowledge workers are really the brokers of information. And in Nepal, they had this, what they call the CYC, a community youth club. And they're, they're primarily youth anywhere from the age of 18 to 30. And they essentially would check out to villages and find out what are some of the issues that people are interested in learning about. They'd come back and they'd do their own kind of content searching, they'd localize it themselves, and then they'd go back out and share it in group settings or maybe one-on-one, -on -one, depending on the need. Um, so I was interested in finding out to what extent and how do these people localize the content that they're sharing with the people in Nepal, and what strategies are they using to actually make this content useful. Um, and then, just real quickly, I can look at method, and I can share this with you more later, so I'm not going to go into depth, um, but I was real interested in the practical use of it, so really the everyday involvement that they have with OER and how they're making those useful on the ground for the people they work with. 
Um, so I had been working in Nepal for about 10 years, a little over that, and we had um, about 10 centers that we had previously been working with. So we figured that was a good place to, to engage people and to start uh, finding out the strategies that they were using. And then to find out more than just those 10 centers, we did do a snowball sample where we, through referral, were able to interview more people. Um, uh, I'm going to skip this and I can share it. Well, I'll, real quickly, I'll just point the big ones. So we did site visits, we did interviews, focus group discussions, and then we collected whatever artifacts we could, um, actual manuals or um, videos that had been made, any kinds of educational tools that were being used. Um, this was one manual that was localized the summer that I was there. Uh, so last summer, about 15 months ago, I was there. and. Uh, we were able to engage people in the process when they were actually localizing this manual. Several experts from several different areas were in the process of deciding how to localize this, this economic literacy tool. Um, and this probably is also less interesting to you, but I will share this if anyone wants. I guess we'll make it available, right, through the website, so you can see how I analyze all the data. Since our time is limited, I'm going to hop to the results, and then hopefully we can have dialogue around this. Um, so we collected this data, like I said, not uh, just one year ago. And by the way, sorry, these were there were four Nepalese people who worked with me to conduct the interviews. Sometimes we found that we couldn't do it in the local or in the national language of Nepali. We needed to go from English to Nepali to Noari or to whatever other dialect there was, and then come back up. And so there are a lot of ways that we had to cross-check the, the data that we were finding. Um, so to the extent, that's what I'll cover first, and then I'll cover the how, that we found that they were localizing. Um, first, we, we realized that it depended primarily on the definition that they gave. If um, they felt that it was more about ge ge geography, then we would have to uh, kind of match what they were defining as localization with the content and see how did they adjust those tools. Um, sometimes we found that it was more about religion, uh, other times we found that it was about um, the local culture in their community. Sometimes it was an issue of age, like something that was relevant for elders as compared to something that was relevant for youth. Um, this was in our discussion where they're talking about what is the definition of localizing. Um, we found that it would reflect lo uh, local resources. So sometimes um, they had certain temples or they had certain religious practices in one area or um, historical dynamic in that area and they wanted something to give respect to the, the God of that area and that was really important for people to resonate with the content that was <coughs> being shared. Um, also that it would reflect their language. We talked about that you'd find these local dialects down in certain villages and it was important that it not be in the national tongue in those areas. Uh, this is, you can see this manual we're looking at that summer had been translated into several other um, indigenous languages. Um, then incorporating the culture, sometimes that is religious and sometimes it's broader than that. It's sometimes an interpretation of Hinduism or of Buddhism or sometimes Christianity, depending on what people embrace. Um, uh, these are like higher mountain people would have a different kind of cultural practice than people who were uh, in the center of Nepal. Uh, so gender sensitivity, that was also a big issue that came up for some people that uh, you needed to make sure that in a nation where women are second class citizens that the content really reflects an equal engagement of women in those um, practices or those um, in the issues that they're trying to cover. So one example would be like um, sanitation or something. And I guess women, because they are usually less educated, they felt needed to be represented as washing their hands, not portraying a man. So they could say this is also a women's issue, not just a man's issue to, to consider those practices. Um, religion, which is tied to culture, but also different. Um, and then the geography. And shared problems. One big issue in Nepal, as in other developing countries, is uh, like water collection. Um, sometimes it's political issues. So if they could gather around one topic and you could have up-to-date information about certain crises going on in their, in their community, 
we would find that would make it, the content that much more relevant. If you could include clippings from newspapers or radio broadcasts, then people would really gravitate together toward those to the, that content. Um, this is a microcredit group. Many people have incorporated economic um, literacy into their programs, and and everything to them comes back to finances. So you need to talk about it like a numeracy, numeracy component. Um, Okay, and then one thing, we in one area they talked about how vocalization means reflecting the, the unity, the ways that, that people come together. Uh, like in an inner city Kathmandu area, we found that one class reflected many, many different religions and different languages and different economic backgrounds. So they had to always focus on how are we the same, and that's how the class could learn effectively together. Whereas in some other communities, they needed to amplify the focus on the ways that they're diverse and addressing the individual needs. Otherwise, they wouldn't feel like their need was getting met in the class. So I thought that was interesting that some people would define it as unity and other people as diversity. And then also that it occurs on a continuum. Um, this, uh, so I, I grouped the centers that we had evaluated in a high degree, medium degree, and low degree of localization. Uh, the high degree, uh, they talked about localization. It actually was a term that they, they knew of. Um, they basically said everything is localization. And this is an inner city area in Kathmandu. And they said, we don't do anything unless it involves some local experts. They go actually and have class out on site. So even if they're getting some OER tools that they might have printed off the internet or they found content online, they always take it to their local community and they adapt it in every lesson. Um, another place, they were working with women. Can you see that at all? OK, sorry. It's a, it's a female instructor teaching rural housewives um, in a semi-urban area outside of Kathmandu. And what we found is that um, the, the women just didn't get it unless it was in their language. Essentially, um, they had to talk about the, the PC. They had to use terms like, this is your home. Uh, inside your home you have cupboards, inside your cupboards you, you group together your clothes or your toothbrush and other things and that's what you can do with uh, technology is you can use it like you would use your home and you can file away different content related to different areas of importance in your lives and anyway so they said they had to change the language uh, to reflect the, the da daily things in the peak learners lives. Um, sometimes there is a medium degree of, of localization, and Gorka, it was one village um, in the mountains that had a good bus route. It was on a, a paved road. So they were able to um, get access to more materials. They had um, more hard copy materials in other places, and what we found is that the way they would supplement some of the tools they already had is they would actually take pictures and create their own content. They really like to uh, photograph events in their own community and um, go interview people and share these kind of podcasts of elders and experts with other people in order to instruct. Um, I'm worried a little bit about time. Let me just tell you there are um, basically several levels of, of um, the extent that people were localizing. And in some really remote places we found that they were localizing less because they didn't really know how to make it useful. It was like if it was, if it was too dense of material, it was really hard for them to parse it out and to break it down into bite-sized digestible pieces for the people at the more remote level. Um, and in this area, we talked with a lot of formal teachers, and they said that they felt pressure from the authorities to actually stay directly to the the national curriculum that was given to them, they hadn't ever been given what they felt was a passport to localize. So we talked about that with some of the district officials in the area and said, you know, is there a reason that they are, are not able to? Excuse me, sorry, I thought that was off. Um, anyway, so sometimes there were authority issues that prevented them from localizing. And then occasionally um, we would find that at a very grassroots level where very few educational opportunities existed, um, they, they felt kind of hampered. They felt like it was out of reach for them. But generally, even if leaders came out with some open educational resources, it, 
it didn't seem um, feasible for them to localize it. Um, so then, how did they localize? I think this is one of the most exciting thing, things to talk about. Um, first of all, they would determine learner abilities and needs. So this meant that a local engaged with locals was the best way that they could really determine what locals needed. Um, and then they would engage locals in actually co collecting content. So that was sometimes through interviews, sending them out on field trips to um, identify some of the issues going on in their communities. Um, sometimes they would translate into the local vernacular. So that includes the indigenous tongues. And sometimes it's even beyond that. It's some of the common terms that they understand. Um, they would uh, allow people to write in to a central place and they could express some of their concerns. Like in one area, they said they would gotten a lot of requests about treating snake bites. Several people had gotten um, bit in that area, so that became an important way that they could ask the facilitator, the knowledge broker, to do more research on that area. Um, this is, it reflects some of the writing in and sharing with the, with the facilitator. Um, they sometimes do a Google search. They can do a broader internet search for a content match, but it's often difficult for them to decide what is quality and what is not quality. They'll sometimes um, pool textbooks together. They, they have like an after-school program where uh, students will bring in all their aggregated uh, textbooks and then those knowledge brokers will sift through and try to find from existing resources materials that uh, complement, so examples or activities that are um, related to what, what the learner's needs are. Um, and then a really important thing in Nepal um, was to bring in a bunch of the local experts and then to uh, invite them to comment on the content that has been collected and is being shared. We found this especially in Pakistan that if the mullahs of the local area were not abreast of what was being taught in the classes, then pretty soon people would start boycotting the program. If they felt it was too progressive or if it was not uh, appropriate to their Quranic understanding, then basically it was, it was thrown out. Um, and then they would embed the content within a learner's profession. Sometimes that's what speaks to them the most is um, whatever, like people who are involved with farming, everything kind of comes back to seed and to whatever work that you're doing in your agrarian life. Uh, this is a merchant, and one, one facilitator found that if she could speak the language of the merchants and package everything in their terms, she had a really high attendance in people coming to collect content from her center. Um, and recently, they have um, digitized a bunch of the archives in Nepal. That's allowed people to search from some of the historic and higher level literature, but it's not interactive and it's, it's somewhat difficult for the knowledge brokers to work with, but it exists and they've occasionally used it. Um, and then, uh, this is the last one, some of the outlets that they would use to share their localized content. Um, they have wall newspapers where they actually would put together all the information that was really useful or relevant to their needs and post it on the wall. Sometimes it was even just an eight and a half by 11 printout uh, that was about crop prices or about job vacancies or about um, certain agricultural issues with pesticides. Anything that was relevant and current, they would post in that way. It was a great way for them to share their localized content, especially when there was load shedding or especially if the internet had gone down. Um, so video and audio files, they would have um, gatherings at night where everyone would gather around one computer and then they would watch a video that had either been created or that had been found that trained around a certain issue. Um, community radio broadcast, this is an increasingly popular thing in South Asia where um, they, they have just local people like these knowledge workers responding to letters or to conversations that they've had in the community and it's one of the most popular ways that people share information. And often the content that they've collected is through the internet that they then broadcast out through the radio. Um, and mobile phones increasingly are being used, although in Nepal um, it's, it's not as popular as it is in India or in Pakistan. Um, TV browsing, this is where um, a, a, radio, or sorry, a TV station in Kathmandu was able to respond similar to write-in requests and then they would do a training, kind of like Khan Academy, but it would be on the TV at a specific hour in the evening. Um, some wiki posting, that's especially among the 
the kind of college age kids that are a um, little more literate than, than those in the rural areas. Some web posting, big letter books, that's really popular for the more remote people where they just print off eight and a half by 11 stories but in big letters so it was easier to read, especially around critical issues. Um, lectures and seminars where they bring in, say, a, a police leader from the more urban area to talk about the impact of drugs or tobacco or alcohol. Um, Printout sheets that they'd send home with people and then they'd become an ambassador to teach those in their village. Um, and then any other appropriate technology, if people had MP4s or if they had um, the ability to run a CD-ROM in their own more remote village, then they'd send those kind of tools home with them with more content. So that's an overview of some of the practices and the extent that they are localizing. Um, let's talk. Does anyone have any questions or insights? Is anyone doing work in this area? I'd love to collaborate or share strategies. Yeah. I'm not doing work in Serbia. I'm just curious, how did you get started? What, where did your, what was the genesis of this? You said you've been working in Nepal for 10 years? Yeah. So I initially went over there doing um, like a review or an evaluation for a literacy organization. And at the time, they were launching a health literacy manual. And uh, basically, we bought, brought stakeholders from all across the nation to start talking about how do we make a health literacy manual accessible to a nation with so many different languages and different geographic issues and different religions. And we found at that time that to have a really good manual that's localized to everyone's needs was impossible. <laughs> that unless we could engage them in creating their own kind of separate manuals uh, or their own print houses out in these remote places, then they're going to be stuck with a national kind of curriculum that, that would meet some of their broader needs, but it wouldn't be tailored to the specific needs of each person. Anyway, that's when it got on my radar. That was in 1998. And I kept on being involved in literacy, and I met David Wiley in uh, 2004, right on the heels of a return when lots of people were saying, hey, we want to use technology. And that was out of my league. I felt totally clueless how to support them. And I also felt like it was competing with some of the needs. I thought, if they don't even have pencils in some of the remote places, why should we even leap and talk about PCs, right? If the electricity isn't consistent or dependable, why should we try to go through that angle. But when we started holding meetings then with some of the stakeholders in non-formal education in Nepal, and overwhelmingly people said, it's not, it's not like you can say that there's a chronological order to development. It happens all at the same time. And if, if a computer is a resource that works for people, perhaps we can work through those who are more literate and use that as a tool to help literate people. But we could complement like the economic activities. They could start maybe finding out about market prices and selling their goods online. One community was really excited about selling Mandarin origins to Japan and making like 10 times the amount of money as if they, working through them instead of working through a trader. Um, we found that people were more interested in, in getting health information that was really current up to date, especially about HIV AIDS or some other current issues where the literature didn't um, that they had in those rural areas didn't cover it. So that's when it was really the people started pushing it and, and I got interested and met David Wiley and got pulled into looking at OER. Thanks for asking. Did someone else have a question? Yeah. Um, so I, I'm a little confused. So just first clarification question. Yeah. So um, is this study about like literacy program so in a sense that you you wanted to educate people about reading and writing uh, as opposed to because see I, I see some are about videos and audios yeah right so so in these remote communities my my first uh, involvement was through literacy programs but then uh, we started looking at the places where literacy programs happen which are these rural community centers. And really, those centers serve people from the literacy programs, but also the broader community. And we started working with the leaders of the community centers who are youth, who are literate already, and who are then brokering knowledge or uh, kind of 
sharing the information that they find that could help other people who come to solve their own problems. So it's connected to the literacy programs, but the OER is really being used by people who are already literate and who are trying to help those who are lower literate or have less access and so to education. And so those, those resources, OERs, are not really limited to the subject of literacy education, but broader social... Absolutely, social. yeah, yeah. And it's finding a way to simplify that content to make it accessible for a broader audience. Sometimes the OER, like if you look at MIT Courseware or some of these other um, OER repositories, it's great information, but it's it's dense and it's sometimes inaccessible to people who are lower literate and maybe in a very different kind of infrastructure from where those makers of content come. You know, so it's finding a, a way to empower really the people in the middle to find those good tools, but then to make it useful for people down on a, on a lower level. Yeah. Um. You, how much of all this activity that you've been able to identify in terms of different ways they're adapting it and using it and so on and so forth really depends on having found OER as opposed to just giving them access to content which you then said, regardless of the license status or anything else with it, you're like, look, we need you to adapt this, it's important to you. Yeah. Because I'm saying, how strong is that connection really or is it more, you know, we as a people believe in literacy and health education and da 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 da, da and we're now creating the tools to make that relevant and then you just kind of stand back and let them figure out what to use. Yeah, I think it's it's some of both. I think that the OER, like they are probably less aware of, of licenses and what's labeled what. It was um, Tapping them into the knowledge that there's all of these other existing repositories and they don't have to recreate the wheel mm -hmm. if they can tap into any of those. But then there's still some of this other kind of blurred, random information that they're getting and then they're pulling in. And I think that somehow they're, they're able to do some of both, but I would say it's much more in the non-formal arena. Mm -hmm. And what was your particular question within that? Did, I mean, I was just curious because you, I guess I'm, because you use the open course for example, and it seems to me, especially like some of the healthcare manuals, yeah. were those developed explicitly as by an organization as OER with this intention, right? Or right. Was it just, well, well, these things are here, and you know, chances are they would love for these to actually get in the hands of people. We're just going to presume it's okay if we empower folks to do it. Yeah. So yeah, they were created prior to OER right. existing, but then they're trying to digitize them and then um, put them into wiki format so that they're more interactive or more usable or able to be modified mm -hmm. and tailored to the needs. They, in, in the past, I've seen, like say back in the 90s, people would literally cut and paste with scissors and then yeah. go to a photocopy machine and, and make their handouts. And, that is still used a lot, but if they can do it sometimes through computer resources or pull from a broader data bank, then you can find that it can be more useful. I guess just sorry, one follow-up okay. to that. Would you say that a, maybe an outcome of your research is that it would be helpful if more resources were in fact created explicitly with the idea that these are the kinds of derivatives that might be created by these people with these tools so that you could turn them there first? Yes. Or something. Is that a, is that a That would be rate? awesome, okay. yes. And we've talked about that in, in Nepal especially, if the different ministries, like Ministry of Health, Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Finance, if all of those ministries were creating their own educational tools in the OER formats, it would be so much more uh, able, be, it would be able to be localized a lot easier. But it's bringing people on board, and then it's this question of funding it and training the people to be able to do it, and <coughs> creating the will and the will W I L L, not the round W A T E L. You know, <laughs> but I mean, maybe it's some of both. But the the will, you could argue, is out there. We just need to help people do it. I think we're, we're we need to stop. I think there's another presentation right now. Is that right?
But I would love, if anybody wants to talk more about this, I'm so open to learning and, and sharing best practices, you know, from what we've learned and what you've learned too. Thank you.